Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Phil, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Hey, I'm thrilled to be here. This is really fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been connecting mostly on Twitter for a number of years <laughs> yeah. now, but to, to actually hang out and have a conversation, that's fun. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's interesting how you can get to know somebody, but not really get to know them on social media. So this is a really good thing to do. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, because you do have a sense of who people are, but to actually have a conversation, it's just a really good thing. So um, you specialize in communications, and I'd like yeah. to, to start sort of in a very non, you've got a brand new book for those of you who are watching, it's called Maximize Your Influence. And I would highly recommend every CEO, every pastor, pick up a copy because this is like a handbook on everything from branding and positioning to, we'll get to it, what happens if there's a scandal yeah. or a crisis to, uh, should you be on TV? Should you? What about traditional radio, social media? It's just very commonsensical, and you've got a whole career in media, which is great. But let's start with something yeah. really uh, innocuous. Let's talk about Christian attack culture, uh, yeah. which you have a small section on. Uh, everybody, I've talked to so many leaders over the last year, particularly since the pandemic started with the election of 2020 and racial tensions and, you know, vaccine, no vaccine, pandemic, you know, the whole deal. Everybody is just exhausted from being attacked. So yeah. can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're seeing in that field and what uh, attack culture is online? Well, I mean, Christians attacking each other has gone back to the days of the, you know, Apostle Paul. So it's yeah. not that unusual. What's happened, I think, is in this digital world we live in, social media has made it so easy to do. And you can attack someone who and and you, and say things you would never say face to face. And that's what really, really makes me upset. I've discovered in my experience working with hundreds of churches and ministries and nonprofit organizations, every church in the world that I know of that's doing amazing things has at least one person, maybe it's a disgruntled ex-church member or disgruntled ex-employee who's taken it upon themselves to get a Facebook page or a so other social media platform or even a blog in some cases just for the express express purpose of criticizing that church. So we just find it so easy to do. And I also think, Carrie, that it's interesting to note that most of the critics don't use their real name. You know, when yeah. you and I go on social media, we use our real name. So you yeah, know who we are. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I get attacked on social media, it's usually by Berean, you know, nine, four, five. They, they love the name Berean, you know, the, the, the guys of the New Testament that were searching the scriptures. Uh -huh. And, uh, but it's always a, a fake name. And so I just hate that wall of it being anonymous. I think that if we're going to have a criticism for somebody, I should, if, if you're doing something I don't like, or I'm doing something you don't like, we should call each other up and talk about it. I just hate the fact that it's so easy today to do it on social media. Yeah. And business leaders, we have a number of business leaders listening as well. I mean, you can do something as simple as owning a restaurant and you get all these attack reviews. You get people who are against you on social media. How, how do you respond? Like when that well, happens. It's, it's a difficult question because we live in an age where a housewife in Des Moines can literally bring down a major corporation just because of the momentum that can be created through social media. So it is something we need to take seriously. It's not just something we need to blow off. And, and I do think there's a couple levels of criticism that we need to understand. You know, very often somebody will you know, say something to me that I feel like it hurts my feelings or I'm offended or it's a criticism. But when I look at it closely, I realize, you know, they just had a really honest question. They misunderstood mm -hmm. what I'd said. That's that happens mostly. They misunderstood. And so they're really not attacking me by any means. It just feels that way. So I always want to take a step back, take a breath and really look at it. Um, on the other hand, there's some people that are just unrepentant trolls. I mean, they're there to criticize you no matter what. One thing I would tell people listening, if you're a leader, don't be afraid to block people. Somehow we just feel like, particularly if you're in, in the ministry or a pastor, you feel like often, 
well, I need to be open. I need to engage with these people. No, no, no. You know what? If it, if it's an unrepentant troll and they're just there to, to be jerks, absolutely b- block them. Don't be afraid of that at all because they're not doing anything positive to help. So it's really a matter of just understanding where they're coming from. That makes a big difference. Do you ever go and check out their profile to see if this is like out of character or, um, you know, I think you say in the book, it's, it's, you know, Berean 792 X and it's got five followers and, you know, do you check out the quality of that's person. happened to me numerous, numerous times and, and I'll check it out. And I realize he's only got five followers, which is probably his family. Yeah. So particularly on a platform like Twitter, if I respond to him, that means my thousands and thousands and thousands of followers are going to see this guy. So why should I do him that favor? I'm just not going to respond. And that makes him more angry sometimes, but just by not responding, why help him by exposing his criticism to so many of your followers? So I just ignore it and move on. I don't think a, somebody with five followers is going to change the world with their criticism. So I just move on with my life. How do you know? Because this is an age and I think there's a healthy side and an unhealthy side, but people are speaking yep. truth to power. Uh, yeah. People do have the ability, you know, it's funny, uh, newspapers still have letters to the editor. And it's yeah. occurred to me that basically social media is just letters to the editor. That's what it is. Here's why the true. president is wrong. Here's what's happening in, in this community and that kind of thing. But, you know, there is a fine line because if you close, if you block everybody and you just end up in this echo chamber of uh, people who say whatever you want them to say or just tell yeah. you you're amazing, that's also dangerous. Do you have any other guidelines on like where criticism is helpful and welcome and where it becomes toxic? Absolutely. And part of that is I like to edit my my social media following, or the people I follow. I like to mm-hmm. edit that list occasionally. I'll go in there and I suddenly realize everybody I'm following is are people that agree with me. And wow. so I'll... I'll get people on the other side of the political spectrum, the cultural spectrum. I want to hear voices about what other people are saying in the culture. If I'm going to stay up with what's going on, I need to hear people I don't agree with. And so I think that's really, really important. The the truth to power thing is interesting because I feel like most people that – you know, run up the flag of I'm speaking truth to power. They're just being critics. Most of them are just being jerks. They're just, you know, they, they, they have this inflated view of themselves. I think a big part of this difference is in the old days of letter to letters to the editor, you actually had to sit down, write out a thoughtful response and send it in. And that forced you to reflect a little bit on it and think. And Today, you signed your all name. we need to do is just hit the button, anonymous. you know, hit the button and say something nasty and move on. So I think what's, what it's caused me to do, Carrie, really is, I have to stop every once in a while and not be too quick on the trigger. I have to just stop and say, I disagree with that. I really don't like that guy or what he's saying, but I can't be so quick to just respond and, and give him my opinion. I need to reflect about it and think about it. Uh, because truthfully, everything that pops into my head, I don't need to share that with the world. And I think Mm -hmm. if everybody alone could learn that it would change everything. Yeah. It's funny. You know, it's something, uh, we debate all the time on our team because I don't want to close the door and I want to be listened. I want to listen. I don't get everything Mm -hmm. right. And sometimes you go in, occasionally I go in, I'm like, okay, this could be a troll or this could be that angry person. But you, you try to respond kindly and you end up in a real dialogue. You may not agree, but like, okay, this is real and it's a conversation, which is good. And then sometimes you're like, oh, I shouldn't have even tried. I don't know why I bothered. That's right. right? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the strategies that I think is really important for leaders to know is when you do engage with that person, I'll often invite them to give me a call or invite them to email me. And that does two things. Number one, it does engage the conversation. But number two, it takes the criticism offline. And yeah, that's the true. minute they go, the minute they go off that li- uh, offline and talk to you the, via email or the phone, suddenly that criticism is gone and it's not amping up and building up and building up on social media and you're able to engage with them on the side. So that's a good idea. Have somebody on your team or you reach out, engage with them either on the phone or email or some other way. And that really helps a lot. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, you have some sage advice for, well, I think we have talked a little bit about handling trolls, like who they yeah. are and who they're not. Anything else on that whole business of being attacked online? Or uh, I guess, you know, theoretically, although I don't think my listeners do this, but uh, maybe you're an attacker online. And uh, let's let's talk about that because that's yeah. interesting, right? We, we try to, you know, our unofficial model is 
Uh, we want to be a place where the good people hang out on the internet. I try not to go on the attack, uh, the attack against yeah. other people. Any thoughts on what happens when you make negativity your identity? Uh, I think that's a really big issue, and I, I'm and there are plenty of people that do it. I think there's uh-huh. a number of even Christians that I know are fairly high level Christians that all they do is I think sit around and respond to people online. And I'm thinking, what are their qualifications? What are they actually doing in the world? Uh, are they just sitting around all day and just? criticizing things on social media. Um, I I have a real issue with that. I think that we need to engage intelligently and be much more thoughtful about what we do. I I just think that's that's really, really vital. And I think when we get caught in this rut of constantly criticizing, it's you know, you, you know, the old phrase about we, we need to be known for what we're for, not what we're against. Mm-hmm. And I think too, it's so easy to just constantly criticize. There's plenty of things to criticize in the world. But um, if we don't be a little more thoughtful and talk about positive things, it's it makes a difference. We have a, you know, it's funny. We have a saying here in Hollywood. I live in Los Angeles. We have a saying here in Hollywood that Hollywood is great at making fake things look real. But Christians are great at making real things look fake. And I, I think we need to be a lot more authentic and real on social media and try to be positive, try to build people up. One of the things I've discovered when it comes to criticism is just gauge the engage them in either a funny way or a really a little more lighthearted way. Some people are so angry. And when they discover I'm not taking it as seriously as they think I should, it kind of diffuses the whole conversation. I think if you can have a little fun with a lot of these guys, suddenly it completely turns things around and makes a big difference. And I think they even see, you know, wait a minute, I was getting a little bit out of shape over something that's kind of minor and stupid. Mm -hmm. No, that's some really good advice. Um, You also say something that I thought, and I think it was a single line, uh, but again, it's a really good book. For those of you who are interested, Maximize Your Influence. You argue there's a place for disagreement and even church discipline, Yeah, but it's not online. And I thought there's a conversation you don't hear an awful lot. I think that's a really good insight. Um, Let's, there is that weirdness. Like you put your, Mm -hmm. your, your finger on the pulse of something that I'm like, okay, yeah, there are leaders who have abused power. There are leaders who need to be held to account, um, both in business and also in ministry. Uh, and and I'm not saying online can't have a role in that, but that's a really interesting thing, right? Like we have this this oh, yeah. global community that we don't really know online, right. and then we have actual people that we do know in real life, but maybe a board that isn't doing its work, or a leader who has set him or herself up to be beyond criticism in a yeah. local context. I'd love for you to dive down on that. Again, it's just a paragraph in the book, but I thought, boy, that could that could be a book in itself. It is important. And I always tell leaders, you know, never fire anybody online, never be critical of somebody uh, online in an email or in social media, either way. Um, and, and yet people do that all the time. There, there was a pastor that was in the news just this past week who uh, uh, disciplined some woman in the congregation because she wasn't living a virtuous life. And she was living with some guy who happened to be on the deacon board. And um, he, d- he did it all in an email. And the email, of course, he- here's the thing we have to remember. The minute you hit send on an email, you've lost control of that email. And that person you're sending it to may be your friend now, but in six months or a year, they may not be your friend. And you don't know what they're going to do with that email. So I think we should, I- I've seen more leaders brought down by just off the cuff, inappropriate emails or Twitter posts or just little text messages than you can possibly imagine. So I think we need to take the way we communicate more seriously, particularly when it comes to email or text messaging, and just don't do those things like firing or hiring or different things like that online. It needs to be done face-to-face or at the very worst on the phone. My, my accountant is brilliant at this. I'll often email him a question about finances or some you know trip reimbursement or something that we've done in the company. And he'll say, hey, give me a call. We'll talk about it. He never mm-hmm. responds via email because he knows it leaves a trail. So it's always better on sensitive issues that you don't want everybody knowing about or seeing. Talk about it on the phone. Talk about it in person. I think that's so much better. Well, I think the other thing to that, too, is you behave differently when it's voice to voice or face to face. Like, because on the one hand, you're saying what? So like, don't actually have a paper trail. So nothing goes back to you. On the other hand, I do know that if I'm decontextualized, I'm not looking at you. Like right now, you and I are having a conversation over 3000 miles via video. I'm going to behave probably differently than if I was just sending you a snarky little this or a snarky little that. And yeah. you lose the context in that. And as a leader, you know, I always tell my team, 
just assume everything you send privately will be seen publicly. Yes. And, yeah. and, and I think that's a really good way to live. Like my team has access to all of my DMs, to my text messages, yep. because that's just how we behave. But I also see it as a safeguard. It's like, if I'm having something inappropriate or saying something snarky, like people are going to know, my wife's going to know, my assistant's yep. going to know, some of my staff are going to know. And that is like, to me, that is so refreshing. I think in this age of ministry scandals and church scandals and business scandals, we need to remember that we, in the digital world, we li- we need to live more transparent lives than ever. I'll, I'll just tell you, Carrie, that river of information that flows into Google is staggering. You know, that, that DUI you got in college that you thought everybody had forgotten about, guess what? It'll show up on a Google search. Mm-hmm. I actually had a pastor a number of years ago tell me, you know, Phil, it'd probably be best if you didn't talk to my congregation about my yacht. And I said, Man, I said, you're an idiot. Number one, if they've got Google, they can download the title to the yacht. And if uh-huh. they got Google Earth, they can download a, a satellite photo of the boat sitting at the dock. So we just have, we can't hide anything. And uh, so let's just lead with being really, really transparent. And your comment about emails and stuff is true. I've got five people on my team that all have access to my calendar, my email, my phone, everything. My wife has it all. And so it just really eliminates the chance of somebody screwing up like that. And you can't have secrets when everybody's watching what you do. I got a, I got a suggestive email from a gal that my wife and I were in uh, South Africa a few years ago speaking at a big conference. And about a year later, one of the girls that had been it apparently come to that conference sent me a pretty suggestive email. And um, I just, of course, my assistant saw it about the same time I did because she sees my emails. And so I said, hey, why don't you respond? So <laughs> the this girl realized my female assistant was watching, seeing my emails and she responded, I've never heard from that person again. Shut down. So I uh, shut it down. So it's just, it's so important in this day and age we live in that we, we live in a transparent way. Yeah. That sort of goes to another issue I'd love to pick your brain on, which is how much of our personal lives do we share? You know, you mentioned a yacht. Yeah. Well, I don't have a yacht. I have a boat. It's 21 feet. <laughs> I don't think that's a yacht. But, you know, I'll post pictures on it. And sometimes mm-hmm. I think like, you know, not everybody has a boat. I get it. Now right. we live in an area with a lot of lakes and, you know, there's a whole story behind it. But I think there's a joy to the transparency that if people come to your house, they're like, oh, this isn't like a crazy house. This is kind yeah. of a normal house. And, you know, I post my backyard obsessively, as, as you probably have seen from time to time and <laughs> and things like that. But there's there's a joy in living Transparent. There are some things that should be personal. You know what I mean? If my wife and I have an argument, I don't have to go and broadcast that to the world. Or if I have a disagreement with somebody, I don't need to to make that public. But um, there's a lot of leaders who you feel, what you said, that comment about Hollywood makes fake things look real and the church sometimes make real things look fake. Like there's almost that bulletproof persona a lot of leaders try to portray online. Can you talk about the... Uh, line between private and public and authentic and um, transparent. And because I think a lot of leaders are confused by that business and church. It's a great question. And it's a reflection of the digital age we live in. I've, I've, I really believe that the digital transition we're going through right now will have more impact than the publishing transition we went through back in Martin Luther's day. I think that um, because it affects so much of what we do, it affects our business, it affects the way we communicate, it affects everything. And so I think we have to understand it's going to impact more of our lives than we possibly think. And so the truth is, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's, the public private thing really is critical but i think people demand today that we be authentic and real now let me say i'm kind of sick of using those terms cuz yeah. everybody says i'm authentic i'm real um but the fact is they want to see the warts they want to see how you live and mm-hmm. i think by showing you know it's funny i did a thing with greg Laurie the other day we were trying to shoot a video that would encourage men to share their faith with other guys and so he has a replica of Steve McQueen's bullet Mustang from that fantastic movie bullet back in the sixties. And so we took it down to Laguna beach here in California, tricked it out with cameras, brought in a big drone to follow it up and down the Pacific coast highway, had a a truck in front of us with a camera on it. And we did this whole program in his car with him talking to a friend of his about sharing your faith. And it was really cool. And while we were doing it, he whipped out his camera and did a little selfie video of him in front of the car while we were fixing it out. And he said, Hey, I'm here with Phil cook. And we got our production team together. We're doing a television show on sharing your faith. It went crazy, largely because it was just off the cuff, casual, behind the scenes, 
people love that. They want to know what it's like to be you. And so the fact that you show us your boat, that you show us your backyard, that you show us other stuff, people do get a kick out of that. So you don't have to show, I, I always tell leaders, it doesn't have to, don't expose the intimate details of your life. Like you say, your, your, the argument you had with your wife. However, I do think that we need to be really a little rough around the edges. One of the things I'm telling people with live streaming over this last year of the pandemic shutdown is that I don't want your live stream to look like a TV program. I want it mm. to be a little rough around the edges. I want it to feel live. And so sometimes social media allows us to do that, which is a really great thing. So very often I have clients I'm working with right now that they want to have five cameras and studio lighting to do a, a single Instagram video. And I said, why? And you can just pull out your phone. It's people, it's much, people like it much better. So yeah, it's an interesting personal public thing. I, I'll tell you a funny story. I did have a client, a pastor that went to, he and his wife went to a well-deserved vacation in Hawaii last summer. And um, they, they took out their phone and they shot some pictures of them around the pool, which was great. They weren't paying attention and they didn't realize the pool bar was right behind them. So behind them is all these liquor bottles all lined up. So it looked like they were getting wasted at the pool bar. And so I saw it when they posted, I immediately caught, texted him and I said, Hey, you may want to take those down and put some other photos up. So we just kind of, we have to be aware of what we're showing in the photos and what we're doing. But other than that, I think having some fun and being real is important. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you you also said something about gimmicks, uh, which yeah. on on social media, which really resonated with me because I think you're right. There's there's a certain level. Maybe it's just my personality type. I'm somewhat polished, but not like really polished online. And yeah. if if you're over polished, I don't know. I find your credibility decreases. Like I don't really. Like people ask me, oh, you're going to edit yeah. the podcast, right? I'm like, no, like, yeah, my intro extra, if I stumble all over the place, we're going to edit that out. Right. But this is going to be an unedited in sure. interview. I always give my guests veto power because I'm like, if something comes out the way you don't want it, we'll cut it out. That's fine. That's up to you. But I don't, if you're happy with the interview, I don't go back and edit out the ums and the ahs and the, yeah. oh, let's, let's, let's splice this down. It's just a real conversation. And so when I see something that's like hyper produced, that that produces in me often, not always, but often a bit of a distrust, particularly like if you're doing yeah. national TV, please produce it. Please do a really good job. Uh, if you're going to shoot a, a video that's announcing a new building project uh, or, you know, a new location. Sure. Yeah. The, you know, spend yeah. a little bit of money on that. But if you're just coming at me from your house or you just want to share something live, like make it, make it like you look at these guys, like, you know, you follow John Mayer online or whatever. He's doing an Instagram live. It's like pretty grainy. He's, he hasn't got yeah. $10 million in production following him. It's like you know, him and his phone. Uh, thoughts on that idea of high production value and high trust? Well, I'll tell you something interesting. We have here in Hollywood, we have something we call Q scores. Now, Q scores are basically there to rank celebrities. So okay. if I'm going to hire some big star to be in my next movie and pay him $10 million or more, I want to know he has a high Q score. That means a lot of people really like this guy. And it's a combination of box office and social media response and merchandising. And a lot of things go into the formula. And every year, they release the top 20 most influential celebrities in Hollywood. Well, about a year ago, they released the list. List, and for the first time in history, the top seven places, the seven most influential celebrities in Hollywood were YouTube stars. Now, wow. these are mostly these are mostly young people doing five minute weekly shows in their parents' basement or a spare bedroom, uh, you know, and on their phone or a home video camera. They're the most influential celebrities in Hollywood. Number eight, I think, was um, Taylor Swift. Number nine was Bruno Mars. Then there were three more YouTube stars. So we are seeing a culture shifting to liking what you know, what's real over liking what's excessively polished and fancy. So I do think you've got a great, great point. If we're shifting to really seeing what people are doing off, my, I mean, my grandson loves this kid that, that opens presents and stuff for a, for a living on YouTube. The, the kid made like $21 million last Pretty year. Pretty good life. Such a yeah. huge audience. Yeah. So I just think that the culture has shifted to the point where I still want to do quality stuff. If I, I, we just finished a documentary, uh, a 90 minute documentary on the rise of Christianity in Asia. And we mm -hmm. filmed in India and Mongolia and China and Korea and Japan. And when I do that, man, I want that to be stellar. I want it to be spectacular, but when it comes to short videos on any number of things, we've done a ton of short videos with the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., with the Salvation Army, with other clients of ours. 
I, those things can be very off the cuff. They can be very casual. They can be very, um, you know, just kind of fun. And so I don't think everything has to be super polished and super spectacular, which means anybody could start a conversation online, create an audience, and it could go somewhere you'd never expect. Um, let's talk about gimmicks. Um, you do have a section yeah. on gimmicks that I thought was really helpful. I've always, I mean, <laughs> Hey, I'm not saying I've never used yeah. a gimmick, but sometimes you're like, Ooh, that one didn't taste good. What's, what's, what's yeah. the problem with gimmicks? Well, I, I, I become sensitive to it because I grew up in the fifties and the sixties. My dad was a pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina during that time. And in those days, pastors did really weird stuff to try to encourage people to visit the church or grow the Sunday school. We had one pastor that shaved his head until a certain number of kids came to Sunday school. Another guy sat in the steeple for a week until he could generate enough excitement for people to come. And while I realized their hearts were in the right place, they're just trying to grow the church and reach people. I would have kids come up to me in school and say, Phil, why does Pastor Smith do such stupid things? We don't get it. We don't understand. And so early on, I developed a real sensitive spot to how we're portrayed in the culture, how people perceive us. And so I think gimmicks fall into that category very often that they seem to be fun. They seem to make a big, you know, make a big splash initially. But my question is, do you want to be known as the guy who had a remarkable insight in the pulpit or the guy that had a huge impact on your community? Or do you want to be known as the guy that preached one Sunday in his boxer shorts? Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a big difference. And, and, and I'll tell you what my pet peeve, uh, you may want to edit this out, but my pet peeve is pastor when they start preaching on marriage and sex. Mm -hmm. Obviously those are important issues. They're hot buttons, you know, mm -hmm. issues in the culture. However, I've seen guys put beds on the roof of the church and, and they do billboards that are pretty much short of just a little bit short of X rated. Uh, they're trying so hard to make a splash and seem cool and relevant that very often many of them have come to me later and said, you know, I really regret doing that. I, I realized that the splash I made wasn't worth it because of the legacy it left and the taste it left in people's mouth. So I'm just, I just tell our clients, our pastors and leaders that we work with, you know, gimmicks can sound like a good idea, but they can come back and bite you. And you see it in business all the time. McDonald's, uh, just a lot of different companies from time to time, they'll try something and they look back and realize that that didn't help us. That, that really hurt us. So I think every leader in every area should be just real sensitive and careful about trying gimmicks to try to generate a crowd. We'll definitely leave that in because <laughs> I, I agree with you 100% on that. And, you know, I think I've been thinking about that a lot because, you know, having led a church myself for 20 years. Yeah, I remember in the early 2000s, I think there was a Sunday we drove a motorcycle or a car into the auditorium. And there was yeah. a there was a certain sense at that time that churches never did this. It was new. It was different. And then that kind of came and it went. It was like yeah. a little bit of a fad. And I've realized we're moving into a decade where everybody is sold on everything. Everyone's, you know. Uh, marketed to death and yeah. that real and authentic probably just just cuts through all that stuff and yeah like you know if true. you come we to my house and hang out i haven't got gimmicks for you it's like you know, i'll cook <laughs> something on the big green egg for you we can sit down and have a really nice that, conversation oh, yeah, I love that. we can I hang love out that. right but like i haven't yeah. got a gimmick for you that's not who i am um yeah, yeah anything else about what's what like do's and don'ts of being online well, I think the most important thing about being online is people, you know, people follow you because they want to know what it's like to be you. I think one of the mistakes we make as leaders is we put our wonderful moments up. We put the clip of our sermon from Sunday, or we'll, we'll put some shot of me leading this giant spectacular conference somewhere. And we forget that people just, you know, social media is social. It's about conversations. It's not about projecting this image of being a hero. It's about having conversations. And I think if you can learn that, it's funny, I had a pastor one time that he would post on social media, but never respond to any of the people that responded to his post. Mm -hmm. And so one, one day I said, look, just here's a lady. She just responded to this post you did. Go talk to her. So he went in and said something to the lady. Her next post was, oh my gosh, my pastor talks to me on social media. This is the most amazing church I've ever been to. We, we forget how much people love that. And, and social media influence at a really high level, you know, the people that have millions of followers are largely there because they engage. They're, they're, in, they're engaging with people. So I think remember that social media is social and worry less about projecting an image and worry, worry more about just engaging with people, helping them, giving them advice, uh, having those kind of conversations. That's what people really love.
Yeah. You also say something interesting, because I can see there are probably some leaders listening right now, Phil, who are saying, you know what? That's great. This is why I won't do social media. Uh, everything you guys <laughs> talked about, it's like yeah. I'm, I'm offline or I have somebody do it for me, but it's not really me. Right. Or there's some teenager who who just handles all of that. But you also said, I think this is a quote, that not commuting, not communicating also communicates something. Yeah, that's true. We're in a bit yeah, of a trap. We, Talk about that. One of the important things to understand in the digital age, everything communicates. I, I tell when we work with clients, I tell them the clothes you wear communicates a message. The car you drive communicate, communicates a message. How you walk into a room communicates a message. Your attitude communicates a message. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go out and buy a Mercedes or you have to get a bigger house or you know dress in a different way. But when we start understanding that it, for this culture that is so used to multitasking and getting messages from multiple places all the time, all of those things are sharing a message. Your business card communicates a message. Your receptionist communicates a message. All those things. So just knowing how that works is absolutely critical. And then you can start focusing on, okay, what are the messages that we really do want to share and what's the attitude we want to convey? And like you say, not communicating is, that actually does communicate a message. So I think it's important that we realize that every aspect of our lives is commuting, communicating some kind of message. For instance, I've been in ministry organizations that, you know, the, the, the pastor had an incredible vision. I mean, he had a super amazing vision for ministry, but the culture was so terrible at the ministry organization that that vision is never going to happen. It was just people would, were backbiting. They didn't trust each other. They didn't like each other. They didn't work well together. And so that kind of culture is communicating a message. I just think that we need to understand that in the digital world, everything communicates. And it doesn't mean we succumb to that, but it does mean that we understand it. So we're more aware of what the messages are that we're communicating out there. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, having having designed buildings and uh, being on social media and even choosing clothes. Like, you know, now I've been yeah. working out of my office for a year, so it's a little bit, like my dry cleaning bill's gone down a lot. Uh, <laughs> let me just put it this way. But the borders will open up again. I'll be back on a plane at some point. Yeah. Uh, but Phil, that I think that's worth going there. So particularly for most of the leaders listening to this are in the spotlight of some kind. They end up on a stage somewhere. Yeah at some point. What in your mind is a line between like too polished and don't care? Because there is a don't care part, which becomes distracting. Like, yeah, I never bathe, never shower. <laughs> I don't care. You know, and people are yeah. like, oh, I don't know. I don't know that that communicates something. Uh, and then there's like, wow, you are so polished. I don't even know what to do with you. Or, yeah. or those clothes are so expensive, like, or the, the building, like what, what I said, uh, when we built our last building, which was 2014, 2015, we opened it. Okay. It was my last sort of move as lead pastor of our church was I want it to be really, really high quality, but not opulent. In other words, I want this to, to really function well, to be clean, respectable and beautiful, like, but a simple yeah. design that isn't opulent and a budget yeah. that is, that is fair that's sort of where I try to land that way on my clothes, try to land that way on my house and, you know, that kind of stuff. What, right. any, any thoughts on like what works and everybody's got a different personality, right? So if you're more artistic, it you is. might be, you might care about that or, you know, I don't and let know. me say too, let me say too, it's not just a church or ministry thing. It's secular leadership too. I, I have a, one of my closest friends here in Los Angeles owns a super successful secular advertising agency, very yeah. successful. And he told me the other day, he said, you know, I can afford a Land Rover, but I don't want to drive that because it, of the message it would communicate to my team. He said, I want to, I want to relate to them and them relate to me. And so I, I find that even in secular business, leaders, good leaders are aware of that. And it's really, I, I do think that everywhere is different. If you're leading an organization in, in New York City versus Topeka versus right. Atlanta versus Toronto, it's going to be different. You know, attitudes are different. Income levels are different. Jobs are different. So I like, I always recommend, I want to adapt to the people that I'm leading. I, I just think that's mm. really, really important. If you start wearing sequin sport coats and you're leading in, in you know, Tulsa or someplace, I, I just think that's a huge mistake. Uh, it could work in Vegas. I don't know. But um I do think if you adapt to the people you're leading, that makes a huge difference. And 
really more than anything, it's being sensitive to the people that are following you, the people you're leading. I just think that 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 can cause a lot of rift. Now, truly, I've had this conversation with millions of pastors that, hey, uh, why can't I drive a Mercedes? I can afford it uh, for m- many reasons. Sometimes they have income outside the church, bi vocational or something. And or but they even saved then, a lot, or they bought it used or whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, I've had guys that did all those things and still got huge criticism from the church. Um, so, so in many cases, I'll give you the fact that a lot of the criticism is ridiculous. It's mm-hmm. stupid. But the truth is, if you definitely want to shepherd people and lead them in whatever way, I think being reflective of who they are and being sensitive to who they are, I really do think that matters. Yeah. One rule that's helped me, I don't know, I'll, I'll bounce this off you, is I want to welcome you into my car, onto that boat, or into my house, and and not have it be awkward. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's right? good. Yeah. If it's like, I'm not hiding up, anything. Hey. Welcome. Glad you're here. Let's hang out. What do you want to do? Right. Yeah. If, if I find if you're hiding things, there's probably something that isn't helpful at that level. Man. Well, you know, in a previous generation, I, I, when I started in, you know, in this working with big ministry organizations back in the in the 70s and 80s, there were guys that could afford houses in Beverly Hills or big mansions in Palm Springs or Mercedes, you know, tricked out Mercedes and things. And, and they did it. And, and their supporters, to a certain degree, kind of wanted them to be successful. And, and it was a whole different mind shift. Today, that's completely changed. And it's not that we want pastors to be, you know, grovel and live in poverty. Um, but it's the fact is they want them to be real and, you know, not be excessive on any part of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, I, I just, I, I have a lot of friends that are like you that just, they could probably do things that, that uh, they don't as far as money is concerned, but they just are sensitive and careful. And I think that's just being respectful. Yeah. And hopefully generous first, generous first. Yeah. Well, right? yeah, for yeah, sure. Hopefully. But you know, uh, going back to the start of this question, you, you said hmm. about, you know, getting on social media and stuff uh, kind of leading into this. I think there are a lot of pastors that say, no, no, no. I've heard all the horror stories. I don't want to be on social, but I always encourage people, give it a shot, you know, give right. it a shot, at least take a, have a try. I had a, pa- and I don't want this to sound overly spiritual or cheesy, but I had a friend who's a pastor in North Carolina called me about six or eight months ago. He said, no, maybe about a year ago. And he said, um, I had a, I, I never respond to people on social media. He said, I post things. I have my team help me post, but I never respond. He said, a lady came on my Facebook page and asked me a, a question about theology. And I just felt led to respond. And so I did. Lo and behold, she came to church the next Sunday. And then he said, lo and behold, at the end of the service, she came forward and accepted Christ. And then he said, lo and behold, on Monday, I got a call that she'd been killed in a car accident. And he said, I look back at that and I think, what if I'd never engaged that woman on social media? Wow. What if I would never answered her question? And it sounds, I don't know, it can sound a little bit weird, but the truth is, and, and, and I also understand you can't respond to everybody. There's just no way. But I do, I've seen so many stories of people led to Christ, lives turns around, marriage is put back together that happened because of engagement on social media, that there's a lot of positives that we don't hear about so much. And so I just encourage churches to take, and and I'll say this and I'll shut up about it. By population, you know, the largest country on the planet is Facebook. Hmm. And and my question, my question is often who's sending missionaries to that country? Who's planning churches in that country? Uh, What I'd like to do, if, if people don't listen to anything else I say on this, this, this broadcast, I think if I could get people to, to not just think about missions in terms of geographical boundaries, but start thinking about missions in terms of digital boundaries, Wow, what an impact we could make in the world. So I think there's a case for at least getting out there and experimenting and see what could happen. Yeah. Any other keys to your whole section of your book? The first section is speaking to a digital generation. And I think you're right. It's not optional. I think according to Barna, the average senior pastor of a church is 58. A lot of people who find themselves in business in the C-suite are in their 40s and 50s. So, you know, we didn't grow up as digital natives, but the next generation, sure, they love in person, but they're also online. Any other keys to speaking to a digital generation, Phil? Well, I don't believe in compromising, but I do believe that you need to respect your audience. And the truth is, like you say, the audience you're preaching to today is much more digital. They're much more social media savvy. And so some of the tips I always tell people are, you know, don't be obsessed with your notes. They want to see eye contact. They want to feel like you're in a conversation because they're used to social media. They're used to having online conversations. So when you're preaching, if you get lost in your notes, 
Forget it. They, they will tune you out. Um, the other thing that I always encourage pastors to do is don't try too hard. I've seen so many pastors who thought they were being hip by putting all their notes on an iPad or on a phone. And of course, they immediately get lost. They don't know how to really lock the pages down. And they, how does this they, thing you know, work? I, yeah. I just, I've actually been in a service where the pastor had to stop, ask his assistant to come up on stage and find his notes for him in his iPad. Oh, wow. So look, practice, practice, practice. If you want to be a hipster and try an iPad or a phone, great, but just make sure you've mastered it before you do it. That's so very, very important. Um, another thing I would say is watch the audience. Uh, one of the things that, you know, in the old days, I, I, I've worked with a lot of Baptist churches over the years, and back 50 to 100 years ago, there were Baptist orators. You know, they would get up and preach with really loud, dramatic voices and big, dramatic moves. And I don't care what happened in the audience, they just kept to the plan. Well, let me tell you, if you stick to the plan today, you're going to see people leave. I've actually been to conferences where people left in droves in the middle of a guy's talk and he never adjusted. He never responded to that. It was like, I'm going to stick to the plan no matter what. And he ended up with half the audience he did when he started. So I, it doesn't mean you have to throw out your message. It doesn't mean you have to compromise or go to the lowest common denominator, but just this generation is used to response. They're used to conversation. They're used to being interactive. And so to get up, with a plan and ignore the audience is a disaster when it comes to a digital generation. I think we need to be much more engaged when you're speaking to an audience like that. You know, it's interesting. We're not yet fully in the post-pandemic world, but you made me think about something, which is we've now had basically a year where yeah. everything has been digital, right? For the most part, our in-person yeah. has been severely curtailed to completely curtailed, depending on where you are. And what do we do? How do we behave digitally? If I don't like this, yeah. it's like podcasting. It's like, oh, I'm not going to listen to the end of this or, you know, stop or 2X or whatever. Yeah. I wonder if that is going to have an impact on what happens oh, yeah. in live events a year or two down the road where it's like, you know, maybe you're not going to have half your audience walk out. But if they go to yeah. two or three in-person events and they're like, yeah, this is not working for me. I wonder if the opt out will be faster. Absolutely. Absolutely. Huh. Well, you know what? It's interesting that you've written some great stuff, by the way, throughout this pandemic on, on how the church is reacting and shifting and changing. And I do believe it will change for the long term. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I, I'm I'm hearing some remarkable things. I'm hearing pastors tell me even when the pandemic is over, they're only going to meet physically once a month. The other three Sundays, they're going to be online. But that once a month will be a three day thing. They're going to do a maybe a worship a concert on Friday night. Then on Saturday, they're going to go out in the community and make an impact there. And then Sunday, go to have a physical church. I've uh, heard others uh, that are following a Catholic model where Catholic churches will have a small mass every morning, you know, during the weekday. And they're thinking about, I'll do something like that online. We'll have a small group online mm -hmm. service every single day. One church I was um, visiting in Florida a few weeks ago, they do that. And they're getting hundreds and hundreds of people joining this pastor for a 30 minute little online Bible study prayer time every single morning. And so I think we're going to see some interesting shifts and it'll be interesting to see the way the church emerges through this, but there's no question there's going to be some changes. And a part of that is the audience won't put up with a lot of foolishness. I, I, I've i always been a television producer and I know that people will give you a matter of just three to five seconds to engage with your show. If they don't like it, they'll sw switch the channel. Church is going to become that way. And sure, we can argue about that's not good. We can argue about a lot of things. I'm just telling you, it's going to reflect the culture and we better learn to adapt to that at some point. Yeah. In your book, because you have a long history in TV, you're saying don't write off traditional media. Yeah. Um, so television, I'd love to get your thoughts on the value, the continuing value of TV, radio, and let's say newspapers, whether that's sure. the print or digital yeah. edition, w where is the value there still in 2021? Well, I, I, first of all, understand that when, you know, film was invented back around 1898, it didn't eliminate live events. And then radio came along and it didn't get rid of movies. And then television came along. It didn't get rid of radio. And so I don't think the internet's going to get rid of television. Uh, th they all change and adjust and find a new level, but they all adapt and they continue. And so one of the things we're seeing about television that I find really interesting is that when people are online, they're looking at a million different web pages, a million different places. But research indicates there's a handful of television channels that millions and millions of people congregate to. So in many ways, 
television is America's last great campfire. It's when a tragedy happens, when BLM protests are, are have, hack, have, having are going on across the country, when people attack the Capitol, when there are different things going on, people generally will still shift to television, even though they're an online generation, they will see it on television because it's, it's immediate and it's more extensive coverage. So I think television will always have a place. Uh, you'll find interesting that We've been involved in live streaming for years and years and years with church clients that we work with. And, um, but during the pandemic, we actually had three churches that we were working with that were so, their, their live stream had become so effective, they decided to take that and put it on local television. Huh. So they started doing a 30 minute local TV show in their community, driving people to the church or to their live stream. And it's been super successful. And so, I think we're seeing kind of a renaissance of people going back. In fact, let me just say this very week as we record this episode, this very week, HBO just announced that they're coming up with a super cheap tier for, for people that don't want to pay streaming prices that are going to, that's going to have TV commercials in it because we're seeing so much research that 20 somethings are reverting back to free TV. They're sick of paying all these prices for multiple streaming services. So we're getting a new generation going back to free TV. And part of that HBO is responding by saying, okay, 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 let me respond with a streaming service. that's super cheap, but it'll have commercials to help pay for it. So I just don't count TV out at all. And I think it's a terrific, terrific media for uh, sharing the gospel. That's really interesting, you know, because I I'm I'm barely a Gen Xer. Um, I think I'm the first year of Gen X. So, mm. um, I grew up on TV. I still remember three to five networks. Like I remember that cable yeah. was kind of an innovation when I was a child. The whole deal, and then obviously the internet later in life. But um, my kids who are in their twenties, I have two sons. When they went to college, neither really wanted a TV. And yep. now all of a sudden they're buying a TV. Now I think a lot of that is for streaming and that kind of thing. Right. But um, any idea of the, de- like when I was in radio, I did radio as a teenager and in my early twenties in, in my hometown and then in Toronto. One of the reasons I left radio, cause I had a career there. Like they, I had some job offers and everything yeah. in my early twenties. Uh, but one of the reasons I stepped away from radio is I didn't know anybody in broadcast media over the age of 40. And yeah. I could have done it. Like I had there were good jobs and I'm like, yeah, but then I'm done at 40. And then what do I do for with my life? <laughs> and now, of course, you look at the average age of a news anchor on TV news. They're all in their 50s or 60s often and that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, has has the demographic aged with traditional media? Or do you see that, that snap back now to a younger generation? It does age to a certain degree. There's no question that there's an older audience out there. However, I saw a study about six months ago that indicated 85% of millennials, kids in their 30s and 40s, just want to walk in, plop down on the sofa and see what's on TV. So wow. everything is not, everything is not appointment television. We, you know, obviously I love Netflix. I love Amazon. I, I watch them all the time, but I also, it's amazing how often I, I, I travel all like a crazy person. I travel way too much, but I used to, you know, it's just interesting. You walk into a hotel room, I turn on the TV. I have the option now in Marriott's across the country of turning on Netflix or Showtime or something. But very often I just turn on, see what's on TV. And so, um, I just don't think, I think it's too premature to cut it off. Um, right now, I think there's still a vital opportunities on television if we can explore it. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that, that, uh, that's really intriguing to me because, uh, having been in that field, I've done TV and radio. I kind of like, ah, new media, anything on podcasting and the potential of podcasting. Well, it's fu- podcasting is fascinating to me because it when it started out years ago, it was super popular. Then it mm-hmm. virtually disappeared for a number of years. It, I mean, it just d- didn't catch on. All of a sudden, a few years ago, it blew up again. And um, I'm working with a number of clients that are exclusively podcast ministries. And um, a number of leaders that we've worked with have really interesting podcasts like yours, for instance. And so I think that... Um, there's an interesting, I, I, I spoke at a conference with the head of a, uh, podcasting for Apple about a oh, year wow. ago, and uh, we had a really interesting conversation and just some of the insights. He said, he said, I'm seeing an explosion of Christian podcasts. He said, we don't, we haven't seen the perfect Christian podcast yet, but he said, I'm really hopeful because they're drawing a really big audience. And so I'm really encouraged by that. He also said that the you know, average podcast for him is the sweet spot is about 20 to 40 minutes because he said that's the average commute time, at least here in the the States. He said 20 to 40 minutes is the commute time and the vast majority of people 
listen uh, during a commute. However, he said he had one podcaster that does a history podcast that's four hours long. And he said he has a sizable audience. So I think it's just up to you. It's up to the audience figuring out what your people dig. And and by the way, let me say that maybe this is a place for this. I don't know. I don't mean to hog this interview, but one of the things I would say is I really urge people. It's not about trying to find the biggest audience. Mm -hmm. It's about trying to find the right audience. You know, I think pastors, for instance, make the mistake of assuming their church is going to appeal to everybody. No, it's not. It, there's no way. I mean, Jesus went into places where people turned him down. They weren't mm -hmm. interested in his message. So if Jesus can't reach everybody or couldn't reach everybody, who am I to think I can reach everybody? So what I've learned to do is, I mean, my books, my podcasts, my blog, I know there's a certain type of person that will gravitate toward that. And that's who I go for. I'm never going to be a best-selling author. I'm never going to be this, you know, millions of followers in anything. But I know that people are interested in the intersection of faith, media, and culture. That's where I live. And those people are going to come. So I always encourage pastors that, look, let's find the low-hanging fruit. Let's find the people that would, because of your message, because of your location, because of your staff, your team, your, your approach to life, let's figure out the people that would be most apt to really go for that. And let's go after that crowd. Same with a podcast, a social media following. So I just think it's important to realize it's not about numbers as much as it's about the right people that are following you. That's the way to make an impression. Yeah. And you never know who's listening. That's a thing no. that that blows me away. You could have you could have a hundred people, but again, back to your story about the pastor who engaged on social, the woman yep. became a Christian, car accident took her out like within yep. days. Like you, you just you really don't no. know. And I've been shocked even in this show to find out who we. I interviewed John Maxwell this week. John's like, no, I'm a listener. I'm like, what? John Maxwell listens to my <laughs> podcast? Like you just have no. Or maybe he was being super yep. kind. I, <laughs> you know, no reason to doubt he wasn't telling the truth, but like, I'm like, you gotta yeah. be kidding me. Like it's, it's yeah. crazy. And so I think for a lot of us who are relationally wired, you know, you can see somebody sitting in a row, you can see somebody in, in a seat. You oh, don't yeah. know who those digits are, but you have no idea who you're influencing or the difference you're making. Yeah, that's so yeah. true. I tell you, I, I, I again, maybe you want to cut this out, but let me just say this real quick. I, or years ago, I, I was in Africa filming a, a big evangelistic outreach and um, I got the inter the opportunity to interview uh, interview a guy named uh, Nicholas Bingu. Nicola, Time magazine called Nicholas Bingu the Billy Graham of Africa because as, a, as an African man himself, he had reached more Africans with the gospel than any man in history. And I thought, man, I want to interview this guy. He was in his late 70s then. He's passed away since because this is like 30 years ago. And But I, I got my light set up. I got my video camera. I set him down. I said, tell me about this. The Billy Graham of Africa. You've led more Africans to Christ than any man in history. What is that like? And he was a super humble guy. And he said, let me tell you a different story. And he, he told me a story about years before, many years before, a young couple, a missionary couple went to Africa, super excited, really felt called to go minister in Africa, but apparently they just weren't very good at it. So they preached, nobody would come. Uh, the, the mission board that was supporting them got kind of peeved because they had nothing to report. Years went by, not a single conversion. They built a church that nobody came to. In fact, it was funny. He said after years in Africa, the only person they had any relationship at all was with this little kid who helped them carry their gear and stuff. Other than that, not one convert. He said, finally, after spending most of their adult life preaching and getting no response whatsoever, their denominational headquarters got embarrassed and said, we got to call these guys back. This is just killing us. They're no good at all. So this was a huge mistake. So they called him back and they were so humiliated, so embarrassed. He said, in fact, it was the old days where you had to travel by ship. And he said, after spending most of their adult life in ministry, when they left, the only person that came to see them off was that little kid helping them with their gear. So they got on the boat, they came back, they were so embarrassed, so humiliated that it wasn't but a few years before they both passed away. Absolutely convinced they'd been complete failures. And that's when Nicholas Bingu looked at me and he said, but what they didn't know was that I was that little kid. He said, God didn't send him over to reach a thousand people or a hundred people or 10 people. He sent them over there to reach me. And since that time, I've been able to reach more Africans than any other man in history. And, and I just think of that story whenever I talk about media, because you're right. We don't know who's listening to that podcast. We don't know who's following us on social media. I, I just believe that no matter how frustrating it gets or how we consider our, my following isn't big enough or my audience isn't big enough. All it takes is that one person that could go out and change, change the world. So I just really believe when it comes to media, you never know how God's working. Got chills over that God's, story. What a Thank story. You. Yeah. Wow.
What a story. Wow. That's powerful. And so, you know, and I think, I think that's very easy to kind of, you know, I've led a church with six people. I've led a church with 14, yes. with 23. It's like, that's okay, man. That's okay. It's all yeah, right. Okay. You're being faithful in your context. Hang in there. Exactly. And uh, I think that's good. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about? I mean, it's you, you cover so many areas. Anything that you think every leader needs to know about that? You know what? I would say, the, you know, if we're going to cover one more thing, I would probably say, uh, let's talk about a crisis for a minute. Yeah, okay, because good, good. Because, you know, we live in a world today where almost every week we're picking up the newspaper and some pastor has fallen from grace or a ministry awesome. leader has fallen from grace awesome. or a church member has done something stupid. Um, I just think that it's not if a crisis will happen in your church or ministry or business, it's when it will happen. Mm. And we've just seen it so often. And and the, one, the negative part of social media, it's so easy. It's so mm-hmm. easy to say something stupid to do something stupid I've so many seen so many ministry leaders fall because of something they said online um, and I just think that when it comes to a crisis there's two levels you need to think about real quick one is the spiritual level someone needs to come in could be a staff member it could be an elder it could be an outside person that the church knows who could really shepherd that congregation if it's the pastor who's fallen from grace or had a moral problem bring somebody in spiritually who can keep those people you know keep feeding those people. But the second thing you need to think about is media. Do mm. How do we tell the congregation? How do we communicate this to the public? Uh, do we need to deal with reporters? What happens when reporters come knocking? Do we need to create a public statement? And I often get the call to come in and help with that part of the, the equation. And some of the things I've learned are remarkably simple. And th- they would be things like, I am absolutely convinced after covering so many churches, so many ministries, so many businesses that have gone through a crisis, you could solve 80 to 90% if you just put windows and glass doors in every room in the building. Mm. It sounds so silly. And I've had people tell me, you know, Phil, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen no matter what you do. That's not true. I've seen so many cases where because two people got in a room that could lock the door, there's no window, there's no glass door. Things could escalate, particularly working late at night when you're tired and you're doing things that you probably wouldn't normally do. I just think there's simple precautions that every leader should probably take that would avoid so much of this. And I would also say that if something happens in your organization and you do deal with a reporter or deal with the press in some way, never, ever cover it up, never, ever lie, no matter how Uh, you know, appropriate, you may feel that we should cover this up, never do it. But it doesn't mean, you know, I I always say be honest, but it doesn't mean you have to tell them everything. You don't have to go in lurid detail. You don't have to go into the backstory. You don't have to go into family details, but be honest, but you don't have to tell them everything. And so I think that's just an an issue of integrity and credibility. And it, it just goes to being gracious. And um, I just think that we're seeing this happen so much. And a lot of it is the digital world we live in that's opening up so many of these doors. So I just would encourage people listening today, if you're a leader, always be thinking about what I can do to shore up our company, our organization, our team, so that these kind of things just don't happen. I think that's a really good point. And I appreciate it because I read that whole section of your book too, where you said, you know, don't cover it up, be truthful, own it, own it 100%. Yeah. Um, share it with the people closest to you first. Don't let people be surprised. Like gather your staff, gather the congregation, gather your top clients, yeah. let them know, go first. Like it was, and and there's more advice than that. And I would just say to listeners too, longtime listeners will know, we've had Lisa Turkerst on this show. And when you were writing about that, when you just talked about it, you know, Lisa went through a really, really painful uh, part of her marriage. And she has such helpful advice that she gave on this podcast about what to share and what not to say, share. So she, I think, embodies how to be transparent. She's written two books on it, but she's wow. not like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, yeah. because those are real people, right, with real lives. Yeah. So she has done, I think, a masterful job of figuring out what needs to be public, what needs to stay private for the sake of yeah. the people involved to protect them, Um, but also that the truth would be known. I I just think she's been masterful about that. And I think you see one of two things. Mostly it's cover up and lying, which is like just that's that's horrible and does an injustice to everybody. Um, But that's really good advice. And yeah, I think you're... Go ahead. You also also mentioned... 
you know, your priority should be taking care of the person who may have been abused or may have yes. been taken advantage of yes. or whatever that situation is. So many times I think we fail as church leaders and business leaders that it looks like all we all we care about is protecting the church or protecting the company or protecting mm-hmm. our image. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. You know, you, the first thing you need to do is make sure that man, that woman, whoever it is that was abused or taken advantage of, make sure they get counseling, make sure that you, you cover that cost, you help them with it, whatever it takes, you want to make sure they're healed, they're whole or do everything you can to make that happen. Then we worry about, okay, now how are we going to tell the story, how we're going to get it out there? And remember, in a digital age, if you don't tell your story, you'll live the rest of your life at the mercy of other people who will. So do you want your critics telling your story about how that happened, or do you want to tell your own story about it happened? So that's a good reason why we need to get those stories out there and be honest, just be careful how you share it. And confession and repentance and accountability are, are good things in moments like that. Absolutely. And I'll just say one more thing too. Gordon McDonald's been on this show. And if you want to look at a whole restoration process, what he yeah. wrote in the last half of Rebuilding Your Broken World is the best stuff I've ever read on how to go through actual, biblical, authentic restoration that is fair to everybody involved. And uh, it's just, it's kind of missing from the common dialogue, but that that book is still available. Okay, Phil, one more question. Yep. What's one question about online influence that nobody asks you that you think, oh, I wish somebody would ask me this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know, if anything, I would probably say be consistent about it. Um, one of the things that I find, I just did a social media audit for a major ministry organization here in the country, great organization, but their, 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 their social media was so haphazard. One mm-hmm. week they'd post once, another week they'd post 10 times, another week they'd go two weeks without posting. Here's the thing. Social media is social. I mentioned that earlier and it's important to remember, and we want to have regular conversations with people. So you may not, I mean, we all have lives to live. We all have things to do and jobs to work on. But once you start social media, I would encourage you, be consistent. Start doing it on a regular basis. It may be once a day, twice a day. You know, some social media platforms encourage you to do it at least three or four times a day. Whatever you feel is comfortable for you, but start to be consistent. Don't just do it. I actually worked with a ministry not long ago that hadn't posted anything. They had they had plenty of social media platforms, but they hadn't posted anything for four months. So why even have them out there? Ah. Be consistent. Start those relationships. One of the things that we you and I have talked about an email before is, you know, social media is not about money. It's not about fundraising or donor development. It's about influence. It's really about influence. And you're not going to have influence unless you're regularly feeding people, regularly engaging with them. So think of social media as being about how to grow your influence in whatever area you're in with people. And you only, that only happens when you start doing it consistently and intentionally. Phil, this has been uh, fantastic. The book, if you want it, is Maximize Your Influence, How to Make Digital Media Work for Your Church, Your Ministry, and You. Uh, This has been so helpful. Thanks for coming on and helping so many leaders. I've been been honored. Thank you. Yeah. If people want to find you online, what's the easiest website? And you're pretty active on Twitter. I live at philcook.com. I'm cook with an E, -E P-H-I-L-C-O-O-K-E.com. That's my blog and kind of the center. You can get the book there and uh, other stuff that we do. So yeah, philcook.com is the place to find out more. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.